In this video, you're going to learn why sleep is harder for autistic kids, what's exactly going on in their brains and in their bodies, and when sleep difficulties start crossing the line into clinical insomnia. Hi, I'm Dr. James Thatcher. I'm a licensed psychologist at Forest Psychological Clinic in Portland, Oregon, and I evaluate and do therapy with children and teens every single week. So in this video, we're going to talk how common it is for autistic children to have sleep difficulties. We're also going to unpack the science of autism and sleep regulation. I'm also going to lay out some very clear steps and behaviors that you can do as a parent to help your child fall asleep. And I'm going to talk about when is a good time to start considering extra help like melatonin to help your child fall asleep at night. So first off, how common is it for autistic children to have sleep difficulties? Well, some studies are saying that it's around 80% of children have sleep difficulties. So why is that? Why is this so common in children with autism? Well, let me give you five different reasons why it's so common in children with autism to have sleep difficulties. Reason number one is melatonin rhythm differences. So a lot of children with autism have a difference in when their melatonin is secreted. Sometimes it's a lot later. Sometimes it's much more variable than neurotypical children. And also secretion can be less than neurotypical children their same age. Reason number two is circadian drift. So what's circadian drift? Basically the body is on what's called a circadian rhythm. We have a sleep-wake cycle. And in autistic children, that can be a little bit later than other children their age. A lot of different studies have actually talked about how the onset of this circadian rhythm is a bit later than neurotypical children. Reason number three is sensory hyperarousal. Light, noise, different textures. These things can affect autistic children much more than neurotypical children. They're much more sensitive to these things. So if there's bright lights that are going on, or if the TV is too loud, or too many lights are on, or the texture of their bed sheets are off, they're going to be much more sensitive to that, and it's going to increase their body's hyperarousal. So it's going to be harder for them to fall asleep. Reason number four is cognitive emotional overarousal. So a lot of children and adults, unfortunately, with, with autism, have increased propensity for anxiety and repetitive thoughts. You know, and if you think about it, that's kind of what happens at nighttime, right? Our guards are let down, and then that's when those worrisome thoughts tend to pop up a lot more. You know, I should have said this thing differently to that person, or why did they react that way? And they can kind of replay their day in their minds or even worry about what's going to happen the next day. Here's a conversation that I have to have. And again, when you're laying in bed and your guard is down, that's when these thoughts start to pop up and they actually pop up a lot more in children and teens with autism because again, they have a higher propensity for having anxiety. And reason number five is that the brain is actually wired a little bit differently. So where serotonin and melatonin pathways are actually a little bit different. So there's actual differences in serotonergic signaling that affects the secretion of melatonin in children and teens and even adults with autism. And due to this, some of the research is saying that it affects the timing of the onset of sleep. Let me share an example with you. I worked with a family one time uh, of a six-year-old who looked like he was having a lot of nighttime battles with his parents because he wasn't going to bed till about 11 at night. And you, know, you got to get up and you go to school the next day. And every night was a battle. Every night they tried everything. It was only until we started changing the environment, and I'll get into more details about that here in a minute, did things actually start to work. So what do we do differently? So we changed the lighting. We kept a certain routine. 
And on top of that, we did something called fading. And again, I'll get into the, the details on what fading is. After a couple of weeks of doing this consistently, did we start to see his ability to initiate sleep go from about 11 o'clock at night all the way down to about 10 o'clock at night. And he was able to get a restful night's sleep, finally. And so were the parents. So when does bedtime struggles start to cross the line into clinical insomnia? Well, there's three big criteria that we look at. Criteria number one is difficulty falling asleep, maintaining that sleep so they're waking up quite a bit, or even waking up early in the morning and not being able to fall back asleep. And that would be happening at least three times a week for at least a month. Criteria number two is that this starts to happen despite there being a behavioral plan in place, despite having a set routine, despite going to bed at the same time and getting up at the same time. And then criteria three is how is it impacting them during the day? So are you seeing increased irritability? Are they chronically fatigued? Is it hard for them to learn? That's when it starts to become a clinical issue like insomnia. Now let's talk about what works. What sort of behavioral strategies can you use to help your child fall asleep? And behavioral strategies are gonna be the first line of defense. This is what any clinician should work with you on and try first in order for your child to fall asleep. So this is what you should try first. So here's five different things. Number one, is a consistent sleep-wake cycle. So having bedtime be at the same time each and every night, not fluctuating it. And the same thing with goes with waking up. It might feel good to where on the weekends we can sleep in a little bit. And now and again, yeah, that's, that's totally fine. But when you're dealing with a sleep difficulty like this and insomnia, you got to be more on top of it. So one thing to consider, even though it feels nice to sleep in on the weekends, if your child is having a lot of sleep difficulties, you might want to rethink that family habit and get up at the same time. Second one to try out is a predictable routine. So 15, 20 minutes of doing the same thing in the same order to help unwind from the day. So what that could be is dimming the lights. It could be reading a nice story to them. It could be doing the, having them brush their teeth, put on their pajamas, reading the story, turning down the lights. And it's the same thing every single night. So it's predictable. The third one is light hygiene. So making sure that the bright lights aren't on or blue lights from their screen aren't on. Having things dimmed or even using red light. If you're thinking about the UV spectrum, what's the opposite of blue? Blue is the thing that's going to wake us up. When you're looking at your phone, it uses blue light. So putting some sort of screen on that, or if you still need to see and you still need to do things, red light, right? You know, remember all those movies when they would actually like go into a dark room and work on photographs? Well, what light do they usually use in there? They use red light because that's on the opposite end of the UV spectrum. Number four is bedtime fading. So this is what I was kind of talking about before. So if your child is going to bed at 11 o'clock at night, you're not going to instantly jump to nine o'clock at night. That's just not going to work. You've got to use fading. So if they're going to bed at 11, try having the new bedtime be 1045. 15 minutes earlier. And you're going to try that for a couple of nights until the kid gets used to it. And then once they're used to it, then you bump it down to 1030. And you have them do that for a couple of nights and they get used to it and you bump it down more. You see where I'm going with this. And the fifth one is independent resettling. You know, all of us parents know that our kids like us to come in, and check on them and say hello and give them a hug and kiss them and reassure them. And that can be okay, but what, what starts to happen is that the kid is relying on you to calm them down, when in reality, they need that to happen from them. So tapering that off, 
briefly checking in, looking in on them. Hi, just seeing how you're doing. And then slowly but surely, stop doing that as well. They've got to be the ones to calm themselves down. And when you start to use these behavioral strategies, they actually work. There's what's called randomized control trials that have used a lot of these different strategies. You can call it like a nighttime card to where if you write out all these things on what needs to happen, you know, the wind down time, you know, briefly checking in on them, turning down the lights, setting up that routine, it's just kind of like, like a little card, a little checklist of things to do. In the randomized control trials, they've seen that within two weeks, there's a substantial difference in the onset of sleep in children. So what if that isn't enough? What if all these behavioral supports are not enough? If you've been doing these things for weeks and they're still not working, you're still not seeing the results at that point in time, and I'm not a medication provider, check everything that I'm saying to you. It's just for educational purposes only uh, and, and talk to your PCP. But at that point in time, after you've tried everything and it's still not working, it might be time to consider melatonin. So what does melatonin do? One, it's a natural neurotransmitter that happens in the brain anyways. And what it does is it increases the onset of sleep. This is what helps human beings fall asleep. So going back to the research, other randomized controlled trials have shown that immediate release melatonin improves sleep onset. So they start to fall asleep faster. In pediatric prolonged release melatonin increases the likelihood that they're going to be able to sleep throughout the night and that they'll sleep in a longer duration. So how are you going to put this into practice? You're going to start with an extremely low dose and titrate up. And the entire time, they should be monitored by their primary care physician or their pediatrician. And of course, while you're using melatonin, you don't just give up on the behavioral strategies that I was talking about before. You keep those in place. Using melatonin and behavioral strategies together is what's going to get you the results that you need and what your child needs in order to fall and stay asleep. So even with all these things in place, even with all the behavioral strategies and melatonin, things can still get in the way. What sort of common blockers do I see in, in what's out there in the research? Pain, acid reflux, restless leg syndrome, anxiety, sticky thoughts, sensory sensitivities, late naps in the day, drinking caffeine, falling asleep while their screen is on. Take the screen away. I, I think I forgot to mention that. No screen time, at least an hour before bed. So all of these things can be a huge barrier to falling asleep. And even with all the behavioral strategies in place and taking the melatonin, if something like some of these barriers is what's going on, that's going to impede any sort of progress that you have. So addressing those first is going to be key in being able to help your kid, teenager, or even you fall asleep. And that brings me to adults. So where all these issues can be in place for adults as well, the sleep onset tends to be later. Having anxiety about anything that went on during the day or what's going to happen the next day. All these things can be true for adults as well. And there's lots of studies that are out there. And there's one particular study that's out there that talks about how autism adapted cognitive behavioral therapy is actually fairly effective in helping adults on the autism spectrum fall asleep. But the research out there is still building. This is just kind of new emerging stuff. If you'd like for me to talk more about that or something else sleep related, leave a comment down below. So in closing, sleep is the foundation of regulation. If you can set up the environment and your routine in a certain way, then you can start getting the right signals at the right time in order to initiate sleep. And if you're able to get better sleep, then pretty much everything else, behavior, emotion, concentration, being able to learn during the day, all of those get better too.